uh, which I believe every one of us is kind of aware of the importance of lightweight sites at this point. And our first speaker uh, is Felix. He comes from um, Germany, Hamburg. Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> no, it's totally Hamburg. fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he's an indie hacker. He's been um, publishing uh, tons of uh, small open source projects during the past 12 years. And this is his first international conference yes. where he's speaking. <laughs> so um, let's put some really difficult questions for him <laughs> to the Slido. Um, if you don't know, uh, go to slido um, and put uh, code F F2023 and you can add some questions. We will have a small panel discussion together uh, after Felix and Matthew have both spoke. So let's give a stage to Felix. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, hello. My name is Felix Gnas, and today I would like to talk about static site generation, or SSG for short. And um, yeah, in this talk, we'll take a look at different front end frameworks and we'll see how we can use them to generate static websites. And we'll do this all without using any meta frameworks on top, yeah? So we will be building basically everything from scratch, which will give us a chance to take a look at the underlying basic concepts, yeah? And learn uh, what it needs to, to, to actually generate a static website. But um, before we dive into that, let me quickly explain how I got interested in SSG in the first place. So, I work at a green IT company in Germany called Lionizers, and we develop sustainable software for our clients. Yeah, this means that whatever we do, um, we try to be very mindful about the resource consumption of our software, and we try to write everything as energy efficient as possible. Um, so, my personal journey into SSG started when we asked ourselves, what would be the most sustainable way to rebuild our own website. And yeah, there are lots of useful resources out there and I'll come back to them later. And um, there will also be some talks here at the conference tomorrow on that uh, green computing topic. So make sure not to miss them. Um, but for me, there were two really important key takeaways. So the first one was try to perform as little computation on each request as possible. Yeah? And the second was try to minimize the amount of data that you send down the wire to your visitors. Now, let's start with the first topic, computation. So, one simple and efficient way to reduce the amount of computation um, is to generate the HTML ahead of time. Yeah, and this is basically already the core idea of static site generation. So this way, whenever a request comes in, yeah, no script needs to run and you don't have to access any databases or so, you can just serve your pre-generated markup. And yeah, as a nice uh, side effect, um, this also minimizes the attack surface of your website. Yeah? So it does not make it uh, more secure, but it also scales very well, and it's pretty cheap to host, since we are only dealing with, with static files. So you can get even free hosting in, in some cases. Okay, but yeah, back to our requirements. So my team usually builds web apps yeah, with React, and we wanted to use a familiar framework. So the idea being that developers um, who work on the website would not have to learn any new technologies. So instead of um, yeah, using a templating engine maybe, like a lot of classic static site generators do, um, it would be great if we could use exactly the same stack and the same tools for building a content-driven website as we do for building um, super interactive applications. Um, yeah, and it turns out that with React, 
um, rendering static markup is actually pretty straightforward. Yeah? So at the end, it boils down to these two lines of code. And it's very similar with other frameworks. So this is the same in Preact, or in Vue, or in Solid. Yeah, so they all have um, APIs to do something like that. Um, so, yeah, static markup is fine, but what about user interactions? I mean, after all, this is usually why you would want to use a framework, uh, a front-end framework in the first place, yeah, to add interactivity to your, to your website. And this is where hydration comes into play. Um, so all the classic front-end frameworks offer some kind of API to bring static HTML back to life. Yeah, you give them some pre-rendered DOM nodes, and they adopt them and attach their event listeners. So assuming that the document structure is exactly the same um, as, which, uh, as what the client would have rendered, um, you won't see any flickering, and the existing DOM nodes will just be reused. Um, yeah, but this means that we need different code on the client as we need when we are generating the markup. So on the server, we want to call our static rendering API, while on the client, we want to perform that hydration step. And fortunately, this is something that Vite supports out of the box. So if you're not familiar with Vite, you can think of it as a bundler, just like Webpack, yeah, just uh, faster and I think it's, it's easier to use, and um, yeah, you should take a look at it if you, if you haven't already. Um, and this is a screenshot taken directly from the Vite documentation. Um, so the idea is that we have two different entry files. So we have a client entry file, um, which performs dehydration, and then we have a server entry, um, which will render the static markup. And then we also run two different build commands, which will produce two separate bundles. So first, we perform a regular client build, yeah, just as if we were building a single page application. And after that, we perform a second build, where we point v to our server entry file, which is what the dash dash SSR argument is for. <clears throat> Yeah, so in its uh, most simple form, um, such a server entry file could export um, a render function returning just a static string of, of HTML. But there's one issue with that example. Um, we need some way to tell our app which URL it should render. Yeah, otherwise, all our pages would look exactly the same, which would be a bit boring. And um, yeah, if we were writing a single page application, we would probably have some sort of router component yeah, that reads the URL from the browser's window location. Um, but in our case, um, since we are running on a server or maybe on the command line of our local machine, um, there is no browser and therefore there is no window global which we could use. Um, yeah, but luckily, um, all the popular routing libraries support some way of passing in a static URL. So this is an example taken from React Router, um, but it looks pretty similar with all the other routers. Yeah, so if you browse their docs and look for keywords like static or in-memory or SSR, SSG, they have you covered. And yeah, maybe it's important to point out that Vite itself does not really care about the content or the structure of that server entry file. So it's completely up to us developers to define a contract. And a very basic contract could, could be this one. Yeah? So this is the signature that I used in the previous examples. But we could still improve that a little bit. For example, um, we could make that render function async, yeah? which would allow us to load data from an external data source, for example. Or maybe instead of returning just a single string of HTML, um, we could return multiple chunks. So um, here I'm returning an object with CSS selectors as keys. And um, this would allow us, for example, to inject a style sheet into the document head. Yeah. So this all depends on the glue code which will consume our server bundle. Now, for our use case, um, 
This could just be a simple script that generates a bunch of static files. And in such a script, we would first import the render function from that server bundle, which Veet generated for us. And then we could loop over a list of URLs that we want to render, um, pass a different URL to our render function each time, and then write the HTML to a file. Now, this HTML would still be missing some important bits, like a doc type declaration or um, the root HTML element, and um, yeah, most importantly, um, a script tag referring to the client bundle, yeah, which would perform the hydration. Now, all these things will be contained in the index.html file that is generated during the client build. Yeah? Remember, we performed two builds, and the first one is exactly the same process as if we were dealing with a single page application. So this will yield a basically empty um, index.html file with no markup in there, um, just these, these basics. And yeah, then we could um, just do some string replacement and, for example, um, look for an HTML comment and replace that by our generated markup to inject that markup in the surrounding page template. Or maybe a more advanced solution, if you remember um, that example with the CSS selectors, would be to um, use some lightweight HTML parser to parse that index.html file and then inject our bits and pieces into the right places. Um, okay, now we have a rough idea of how to generate static markup. And by doing so, we found a good way to reduce the amount of computation that happens on each request. But if you remember that slide from earlier, we also want to reduce the amount of data that gets transmitted. And here we need to take another look at hydration. So unfortunately, in order to hydrate a page, the browser has to download the JavaScript of all the components on the page and also probably the initial data that the server might have fetched from somewhere. Yeah, so this is a lot of wasted bandwidth and the question is if there is anything we can do about it. Now, one approach would be to use something like React Server Components but that's a whole different topic for another talk, yeah? So it would also be nice to find a way or a more general solution that would not only work for React, but for all the other frameworks too. And such a solution um, is the so-called island architecture. And in contrast to React server components, this can basically work with any front-end framework. Yeah, so let me show you what that term means. So imagine a page like this, where we have some truly static, static content, which is all the gray boxes, and some parts that do require interactivity, yeah, like an image carousel, for example, or a search widget, or maybe a burger menu in the corner. And now the idea is to hydrate only these green parts and to leave the rest of the page alone. And this is why this pattern is also called, called partial hydration. And partial hydration also means that we don't have to hydrate everything at once. Yeah? We could, for example, wait until a component enters the viewport. So we would not download anything um, unless the component becomes actually visible. Or we could wait until a certain media query matches. So if you think of that burger menu, maybe this is only displayed on smaller screens, and hence if we are uh, viewing our page on a larger viewport, um, we would not need to download that component source code at all, and we would not need to hydrate it. Um, yeah. Or we could maybe wait until um, the user signals some, um, some, some kind of interaction. Yeah, maybe they are um, moving their pointer towards our component, or they are hovering it, or maybe they click it. Um, so we could wait with the hydration of that component until then. Okay, but how can we pull this off? Yeah? How can we partially hydrate a page? So, to answer that question, let's take a look at some rendered HTML first. So, here is a markup of a rendered counter component. Yeah? It's just a span with a number 99 and a plus and a minus button right next to it. Now, um, 
we would need some way to mark exactly that part of the document as being an island, yeah? so that we can pass exactly the right node to the hydration API. And a common way to do so is by inserting a marker script right after the component. And in this marker script, we could, for example, put uh, some JSON with the initial properties that our component might need, yeah? like the 99 in this example. Mm. And it could also contain some hydration conditions. For example, we could put in there a media query, which we want to wait for. Um, yeah, and then we could maybe have a data attribute that um, points to the source code of the component. Yeah, so this would be a file containing only the source code for this one component and nothing else. And whenever we decide that we want to hydrate our counter, we could load um, the script on demand. But um, yeah, we therefore need, again, different code. So while we are generating the HTML, we want to append that marker script. Um, but when we are rendering the component on the client, it should behave just normal. And again, Vite can help with that. So Vite supports plugins which can hook into various phases of the build process. And um, here's a simple plugin that implements the transform hook. Yeah? So right now it does nothing, but it receives the source code and the file name and some options. And yeah, currently it just returns the original source code without any modifications. But we could, for example, use um, these options um, to check if we are performing a server build. And if this is a server build, and we determine that we are currently processing an island, then we could return some completely different code. Um, for example, the code of our component plus something that will generate um, this marker script. Now, the question is, um, how could we identify a component? Yeah, how could we know that the file we are currently transforming is actually an island and should be hydrated? And yeah, preferably, um, we would do this in a way that would work across all the different um, frameworks. So one thing we could do would be to introduce a naming convention, like naming um, our files .island .whatever. Yeah? And the best thing about that approach is that we can use another great read feature, which is called glob imports. So by using that special import.meter.glob function, we can import multiple files at once, namely all the files that match our naming convention. And um, then Vite will turn this code into that. Yeah, so um, you get an object with the file names as properties and an async loader function as value. So this allows us to load any component on demand whenever we need it. And yeah, with all this in place, we can already write a simple hydration script. So <clears throat> we would first call query selector all to find our marker scripts and then loop over them and use a data attribute to identify the chunk of code that we need to load load the component, parse the props, create the element, and finally hydrate it. Yeah. So coming back to the title of this talk, this means that you indeed might not need a full-blown meter framework, um, but maybe just a Vite plugin that does all these things for you. And this is exactly what Capri is. So Capri is a small open source project that I created last year. And under capri.build, you can find a Vite plugin with adapters for all these UI frameworks. And that plugin allows you to generate static websites with interactive islands. OK, so what sets Capri apart from a classic meta framework? Now, meta frameworks, they all come with batteries included. Yeah? So for example, they handle the routing and the data fetching for you. And sometimes um, they also come with built-in support for markdown parsing or image optimization and stuff like that. 
And with Capri, on the other hand, you bring your own stack, yeah? just like you do when you build a regular single page application. So you pick a front end framework, um, you pick a router, and maybe also a library um, that handles the data fetching for you or to deal with your, your markdown files if you have some. And um, yeah, while this might sound like a drawback at the first glance, um, it does have some advantages. Um, for example, it allows you to use really cool new libraries. So the Capri website, for example, uses content layer to consume markdown files in a type safe manner. And um, if you're using this, this feels really like, like magic, yeah? So you should give it a try. It's contentlayer.dev, really awesome project. Or another example last year was Tanstack Router, yeah? So um, this could really be a great fit for Capri websites since they plan to ship adapters for all the same frameworks that Capri also supports. Um, but for me and my team, um, the biggest advantage is that you don't have to learn any new APIs. Yeah? Okay, maybe you have to look up how to provide a static URL to the router that you are using, but that's all. Yeah? Apart from that, you build your pages as if you were building a single page application. And in fact, your client entry file will actually be a regular SPA. So Capri will use that version during development. Yeah? So you get super fast hot reloading and all the nice features like pretty error overlays and all the stuff that Vite provides for you. And this also means that you can remove the Capri plugin at any time and you will be still left with a fully working SPA. Yeah? So there is no lock-in of any kind. Um, and that SPA mode, in fact, unlocks another great feature that I would like to point out. So imagine you hook your website up to a headless content management system. What you usually want is some kind of live preview, yeah? So you can see what your content will look like on the actual website. Now, with classic SSG, this requires a round trip to the server, yeah? You have to kick off a new build in order to see what your content will, will look there. But um, if you had an SPA version of your website um, that could directly talk to the CMS, then you could have instant previews without running a preview server at all. Um, and if it loads, yeah, this is um, a video of me editing a Capri website in Sanity Studio. So that's the admin interface of Sanity IO, um, a, great content, uh, a great content management system. And as you see, the content changes that I'm doing are re immediately reflected um, on the right-hand side of that split pane. Um, and I really like this setup. So I think it gives you the best of both worlds. So while your editors get these instant previews, your regular visitors will get super lightweight pages containing only the bare minimum of JavaScript. Yeah? So if no islands are present on a page, then there will be no JavaScript at all. And if there are islands, um, it will only contain that small hydration script, plus it will download um, the component code for uh, the islands that need to be hydrated. Yeah? And while um, the SPA version can get pretty large, um, this is not really a problem, yeah? because you just use it for your editors, and it can be cached forever. And since your editors are usually always the same people, um, that's not really an issue. Um, in contrast, it's, it's a good feature that they don't have to download the same stuff all over again. Um, and yeah, all this can be deployed together um, to some static file hosting service, like GitHub Pages or a plain S3 bucket, for example. Yeah, so next time you uh, need to build a small to medium-sized website, go check out capri.build. There's a command line tool to bootstrap examples for the different frameworks. And there are also some super convenient one-click starters. Yeah, not only for Sanity, but also for Storyblock and for Tina CMS, um, which are both really great headless content management systems. So speaking of Tina CMS, um, here's a short video of me editing um, a Tina website. And as you see, this is uh, pretty tightly integrated. Yeah, so the elements on the right side will light up if you focus their input elements in that um, edit panel. And yeah, again, this is all just static files. Um, 
yeah, pretty, pretty nice. Um, now, I should maybe add a little disclaimer. So Capri is really just a small indie hacker project. Um, for me, it was a great way to learn about the inner workings of the different tools and frameworks which I had used before, but I had no idea what they were actually doing under the hood. Um, and as you know, the world of web frameworks and their ecosystems really moves fast. Yeah? So chances are that some of the examples might become outdated and it's not so well maintained by me. So if you're looking for a really well maintained alternative, I can highly recommend checking out Astro, which uh, Matthew will show you in the next talk. And while Astro comes with a little, yeah, with a slightly different set of trade-offs, it also addresses a lot of the problems which I, which I have mentioned in this talk. So, nevertheless, I think that Capri provides a really interesting approach, which I would like to explore further in the future. And the thing that strikes me most is the idea that such an approach might help to counteract the fragmentation of the web a little. Yeah? So instead of having a separate standalone meta framework for each and every single, single front-end framework, it would be great if they could share some common code base. And yes, I think that, that Vite could really be a great platform for that. So no matter what technology or framework you pick for your next project, please spend some time and think about the resource consumption of your software and your infrastructure. And as I said, there are lots of useful resources on that topic in general. So if you're interested in making your website a little bit more carbon friendly, hit me up on Twitter. I can share my favorite bookmarks with you. And also, in case you happen to play around with Capri, just drop me a line and let me know your feedback. And yeah, always questions and ideas and pull requests are always welcome. So thank you. <laughs>